Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk about why I left Carbine Studios. So I left in 2011, uh, end of June. It's only the second time I ever walked away from a game in development. But it Wildstar, which was that game, did ship, uh, just like the first game I walked away from, ever uh, Fallout 2 shipped. Which makes, I mean, I'm happy that every game I ever worked on, or got paid to work on, shipped. Even the ones, the, the two, that I walked away from. In many ways, this story is kind of like Leonard's story about vampire. You know, it was a rough development. I don't really like thinking about it. Um, but let me give you a little background. So Carbine is a division of NCSoft. NCSoft is a South Korean company that's headquartered in Seoul. Uh, they had a North American home office in Austin. The president there was Robert Garriott. I mentioned him in a previous video. He was really cool. His brother, Richard Garriott, was working in Austin at uh, NCSoft there on Tabula Rasa, uh, the MMO he was making. In many ways, Carbine was one of the best companies I ever worked at. Um super talented people. I mean, I worked with some of the best people in their fields. Brilliant programmers, brilliant artists, really brilliant designers. I wor uh, I worked with probably the best graphic programmer, the best network programmer, best concept artist, best animator, just best social designer that I've ever worked with. Um so I was working with super talented people. We were working on an original IP, which is my personal favorite thing to do. And the pay was phenomenally good. I don't think I ever before or since made a base annual salary equal to what I made at Carbine. They paid really well. So I worked there. I worked there for six years, but I was, I was hired as the programming director in August of the end of August of 2005. I was still closing down Troika while I was doing that. I was hired as a programming director. There were three uh, programmers, one of whom left soon afterwards. He was already planning to leave and he left. Um, so I my job was to staff up the programming department and make an engine from scratch. There was no engine and they didn't want to use an existing one. They had a lot of ideas, uh, things they wanted to support um, so my job was to make that happen. And we worked for three years on that and it was awesome. We had a really fantastic MMO engine, but it had been three years. There was still no setting, no story, no classes. The head office was really, really upset. They sent out a new studio head. He looked at all the departments. So every department was responsible for showing what they've done. So this would have been early summer of 2008. So I've been there just under three years. Showed the engine. He liked it. The art uh, director showed his stuff. They loved it. Design was fumbling. Um, the studio head asked a lot of hard questions, like, why aren't there any classes? Why is there nothing? There's a, there were a bunch of starts and stops in lots of different directions. The studio head decided unilaterally to fire every designer, except one. I believe he was the item designer, and I used him as the item designer. They then started searching for a replacement. They put out a job rec for a design director. Nobody applied. And part of this was, I mean, design directors don't just float around looking for um, job, you know, positions. But also, no one had ever heard of Carbine. NCSoft was really popular in Korea. Um, I don't think they had put out any of their own stuff here yet. So after... I bet it was about two months. The studio had asked me if I would do it. 
and he prefaced it by telling me the studio would be shut down if I said no. He said they hadn't found anyone. The NC Soft soul thought I was a good candidate. Pretty much would I do it? So I agreed. I said, you know what? I love being programming director, but I've got a really good person to replace me in there. I'll do it. Then after I accepted that, that's when the studio had said, oh, you have 90 days to create a setting in classes and we're going to have a meeting in Seattle with all the NC Soft companies because they owned several other companies, ArenaNet, uh, um, I'm, my mind is blanking. Um, this is probably my toughest monologue to do. So in those 90 days, I not only had to create the setting and the classes, but I also had to staff up. One of the programmers wanted to switch over, Mitch Ferguson. So I was like, yes. Um, we worked really hard on classes while hiring staff. I still remember there were some people who had been hired whose start date happened after the previous people had been let go. And I had to meet them, explain who I was, explain why the other people weren't there and tell them what I needed them to get started on. And they were good. They, they got started. Um, pulled it off. Um, with their help, we made nine new classes. They were the classes that the game shipped with. We had a setting outline that mo got modified over time, but... The home office liked what they saw and said, this is good. Keep going. So I started suggesting a bunch of new things, uh, new design elements like player housing, which was a player could buy a house and completely decorate inside and put different plots that they could decide to go in up, farming plots, archaeological digs, other things that went outside. Bunch of story points. Um, I actually did a talk at GDCO in 2010 about moving certain story elements to the end of the game. So these things were advancing. We were doing lots of stuff. Um, oh, added character paths. Uh, Richard Bartle, the guy who invented the first MUD, talked about how there are different kinds of players. There are players who want to fight and players who want to explore and players who want to socialize. And so what I did is, so the classes became my definition of what the player was capable of doing, but paths were orthogonal. They were a way of the player telling the game, this is what I like doing. I like exploring. I like fighting. I like meeting with other players and doing things for them. So one of my level design leads and his team took paths and ran with them and came up with a really good way all those would work, um, especially Explorer Path, which I will talk about in a minute. All of these, by the way, made it into the shipping game. But the art director and I weren't seeing eye to eye on a lot of things. He was he, I, not the original art director, but the original art director got let go, I think within about a, the first year, year and a half, I never found out why, which is kind of odd that as a director, I did not know why. But a new director took his place. He did not seem to like me. He was kind of hostile to me. His artist, though, after I became design director, really started following his lead. Um, by the way, I took the best notes during this time period because I had gone all digital and I'd often go home at night and just write down what happened. Because I was super excited. I was making my first MMO. I'm like, I'm going to take the best notes ever. Then as things got bad, I'm like, I'm going to take these notes. One day, an artist came into my office and said, hey, I heard you sucked as a designer. I mean, first of all, who says that? But I could also tell he was trying to make me angry. And as <laughs> some of my friends know, when you try to make me angry and I figure out that, I don't get angry. I start playing around. So I started pointing out I have 27 years of design at this point. He had none. So, you know, I guess he doesn't really know what he's talking about. Do you often go around just spouting out things you know nothing about? I guess that's something. And he basically got upset and left. A few months later, same artist came by my office and said he wanted to show me something. And he wanted to show me in his office. And I went, followed him back to his office. And he showed me double jump, which was a, a character could jump. And then it, within a few frames of the highest point of their jump, if you press jump again, you'd go up again. So you could reach really high. And I loved it. And I said, oh, let's add this to the Explorer path. And he was shocked. And he said, but I, I was told you never took artist ideas. And I was like, do you remember the Spouse Slinger? The really cool guy? the One of the people's favorite classes. It's a magic tech mix and it's a range damage and crowd control. I said, 
the lead concept artist. That was his idea. He showed me a picture one day when we were struggling to make the nine basic classes. He goes, wouldn't this be cool? And he even had ideas of how it should work. That went into the design. And I said, you know all this. And he goes, yeah, yeah. He was just mumbling, yeah, yeah, I know this. So I said, well, why are you saying these things then? He goes, oh, I just, I hear someone above me say it. Keep in mind, above him was a lead, the art director, and the studio head who asked me to be design director. So then I was having a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a lead artist that our producer had set up for so we could talk over certain things that he wanted us to, we both had things we want to talk about. So halfway into the meeting, he said, I hate meetings with you. They have no agenda. I was like, the meeting was going well, I thought. So I said, if you look behind you on the whiteboard, what do you see? And he looked on my whiteboard and there was a list. It was called, it has his name, meeting agenda, and it had topics. And we were about halfway through them. And I was just like, where did this guy? I said, we're obviously going through this. And he was like, I don't know. I just, I don't know. And I'm like, do you have something you want to go over that we haven't gone over? And he goes, no, I don't know. And it was the weirdest thing. And I'm like, I don't know where this is coming from. I know. And also just to throw it out there, because it's another artist example, well after I left. And I think after Wildstar came out and didn't do well, and I think it had already been closed down. An artist posted online saying, all kinds of wild things. He said, I ruined the design of the game. I worked on it for four or five years and everything I did was thrown out. Well, first of all, I only worked on it, the design, for a little less than three years. I, he may be conflating me with the original designers. Certainly didn't work on design there for four or five years. Plus, a ton of what I did shipped. So again, it's like there was this, this anger that even was there after I left, you know, and wasn't a target anymore. That artist just like, Ugh. So then I started noticing that a lot of this was coming from the art director. And I asked him about it, and he said, well, you hate artists. And I'm like, what? I said, I go to movie and game nights with several people from your art department. And he was shocked. And then I said, you know, I started a game company called Troika with two artists. And he was, so I said, I don't think it's artists in general that I hate. Well, he just got like, became even more draconian and not just with me. So he made a rule that nobody from any other department, including directors, could talk to any of his artists without him, without going through him for the appointment and possibly him being present. And he said that in a director's meeting. And I was like, so what about you going to other departments? He goes, oh, well, I'm going to have to be able to talk to designers and directors whenever I want. I was like, well, that's hypocritical. I would go to the studio head and go, what is going on with this guy? And he wouldn't back me. He kept saying, look, you're in charge of design. But then the art director would make design choices and the studio head would back him with no other reason other than what he says he needs to do it this way to make the schedule. And then it caused problems. And he goes, well, you're going to have to fix that. You're design director. I'll give you an example of one of those in a minute. Um, he would also say I was in charge. The studio head would say I was in charge. But then... If I did something he didn't like, he'd run a competing design strike team with my own designers just to test other ideas. And then one time my group, my strike team made something and his strike team made something. And we showed it to people in the company without them knowing who made what. And my strike team won the popular vote, whatever. You know how much I don't like games made by committee, but whatever. He still said he was going to do things with the way his strike team was. And he asked, and again, he asked me to fix his strike team's problems. And I was like, ugh. Anyway, things came to a head in January of 2011. Uh, the art director sent out an email. I pretty much caught him out for lying in it. I basically said, I didn't say he was lying, but I said, hey, you're being disingenuous. And that's not what we agreed on. And I posted an email saying what we had agreed on. What, so what he had just said in email was not what we agreed to do. He stormed out of the building screaming bringing the producer, Eric DeMille, who, by the way, I'd worked with years before and continued to work with years after, came in and said, uh, this is going to be a problem. So the studio head got upset and said, you two, off-site meeting tomorrow. Well, remember, I take a ton of notes, and these were all digital. I entered the art director's name, took the search results, output it to a file, and printed it. It was really thick. Showed up at the meeting. 
I said, do you mind if I go first? They said, fine. I proceeded to talk without pause for four hours. And none of it was, I'm angry or you're a bad person. It was, you did this, you did this, you did this. You said this, you said this, you said this. You emailed this, you emailed this, you emailed this. Point after point after point. And he listened to it all. And then he said, can I take a break? Walked out of the room. Studio and I, studio head and I just looked at each other. He came back in. He had about 45 minutes of things he wanted to talk about that I did. Some of which I agreed with him. But I pointed out there were reactions to him. He did some bad stuff. So finally I started pushing back. And I said, you're, you're literally complaining about me pushing back against you. Some of them were things I was like, okay, I can change that. One of them was something I was about to change anyway. Went back to work the next day and absolutely nothing about the art director changed. He didn't do anything different. So I gave up. I basically said, and I, I told uh, the producer, Eric DeMille, this. I said, I'm not going to argue anymore. I'm not going to resist anymore. Uh, I, we were at a director's meeting and I found out an entire class had been removed from the game without my knowledge. The um, art director removed it. And he said, yeah, I don't have any room in my schedule for this. And I just said, okay, this is going to cause a problem because you just deleted the only magic ranged damage dealer. And he went, seems like a design problem to fix. And I went, okay, my fix for it is I'm re-adding the class. And he's like, you can't, I don't have room in my schedule. And I said, that sounds like an art problem to fix. Hmm. Moving forward, other designs got changed. I arranged the schedule to meet them. Some people on my team were getting angry that I wasn't fighting back. And I said, I, I can't. There is a three-way tug of war going on between me, the studio head, and the, the art director. And if I tug any more, I mean, two ways at least go back and forth. Three ways just go in random walks all over the place. This changed in June. There was a group in NCSoft, Soul called Fun QA. Fun QA would play the games that were due out in the next few years, you know, within, that were like two years out. So games that in theory had a lot of work done on them, but were not far along, far enough along that they couldn't be changed. The studio head told us in a director's meeting that he heard about Fun QA, that we were getting it next week, and we were going to have to go over it as a group, and that it was 100% design complaints. It was all design complaints. And I was like, how could that be? I mean, I talked to the Fun QA people monthly. And they seemed fine with what I was doing. So what arrived was 56 pages of design review, mostly positive. The closest you could come to negatives was questions about some things either they didn't understand how it would work, or they were questioning like, how would this be extended to late game play? And I had answers to all of that stuff. But that was followed by a separate document from Fun QA, 79 pages, nothing but art complaints. Washed out colors, poor prop placement, mean looking characters. There was one character race they hated so much. They said, this won't fly in our culture. This won't fly in Korea. We won't be able to have this race here. Low resolution textures, bad lighting. There was one area that was so badly lit, you couldn't even see the creatures that you were supposed to pick out in the scene. I, I remember saving a screenshot from that because I was like, there's supposed to be like nine creatures in here and you could only see four or five. Okay, that was it for me. Um, after the meeting, I went to the studio head, shut the door, went to his office, shut the door, and said, you lied to me? Here's my resignation. And I left a couple weeks later. I did not know, and I couldn't have known, and the other people didn't know, and they couldn't have known. Within 24, 48 hours before me and after me, the audio director also quit. One of the senior programmers, who was one of the original programmers who was at the company when I got hired, quit. And the lead concept artist quit. All citing, we just can't take this fighting and tug-of-war stuff. And I remember thinking, well, at least with me quitting, there's only two people going back and forth now. Maybe they can figure it out. So yeah, that was the second time I quit. Um... 
kind of just walked away after that. I didn't want to be a lead anymore after that. I went to Obsidian and said, I don't want to be a lead. And I stuck to that for five years. I know I always try to look at events like this and go, what, what lesson did I learn? Because I've said you learn lessons from failure. I think the biggest one to learn from this is Carbine was the biggest example to me of without a singular vision that everyone, directors and everyone at the company buys into, it will lead to ruin. No amount of money, no amount of time will make up for the fact that if you don't have a very clear vision, you are not going to succeed. I tried being that vision person. I was prevented. I tried supporting others, one of the, the others being a vision person. That didn't work. So I just had to remove myself from that. I also learned that no amount of pay, no amount of money is worth that much stress. Like I said, Carbine is my most heavily documented period of my career. It is crazy how much I've written down, which is why I wouldn't say to anyone from Carbine who, who thinks I've mis, um, misdescribed this situation, let me know. Contact me. Because I can go over event after event after event. And I'm not going to argue why people did what they did, what they were thinking, what they were feeling. I will just tell you what people did. And these are dated. I learned my lesson from the previous company. I have a very, very specific and accurate timeline of things that happened. And it's frustrating to look at. It's It makes me just feel kind of sick when I look back at it. And that's why when I went to Obsidian, I wouldn't work on anything in a anything higher than a senior role for years. And also why I didn't take much notes after that. I'm like, look, I'm not running anything. I just want to come in, try to make help other people make their games better. And then I want to go home. And I don't want to think about this. And I don't want to be... I didn't want to be passionate about games for a while anymore. I needed a break. But... In many ways, I told people Carbine broke me. Um, I think I repaired. But I think we repaired in that Japanese way where you can still see the crack and they put gold in it. And they think it's better now that it's broken. I forget what that's called. Um, but I think that's what it was. I ended up with a big crack in me that eventually got filled in with something. Um, and I could lead again. And that's when Outer Worlds happened. Pretty much, Carbine was quite the event, and um, that's why I don't really talk about it that much. But there it is, as in a nutshell and as short, even though I know this is really long, as I can put it.